So um, we're moving things a little bit out of order this morning. Um, you know, we have a saying in, in here that um, this is 1111 after all, which is kind of an in-house saying that if you've experienced being in a community enough with 1111, you know anything can happen and that's okay. We sort of roll with things as they, as they occur. And this morning as I listened over and over and thought about the flow of today's service and, and um, my message and then listened to the last song on, that we have on the bulletin, I, it occurred to me, some of you may know the song, but it occurred to me, that song just doesn't work. It, ju it just doesn't work. Uh, the next song that you'll hear this, that was supposed to be in between the, the text and the message does actually work. So I just walk up to Brad, and, and of course the band is, is very laid back and, and, and rolls with the punches as does Brad. And um, so uh, um, we won't be having that. So we just change up the order just a little bit, and then there's a couple of other little surprises that um, happen in the moment. And uh, call it the spirit moving. Call it Tom is ADD. Um, <laughs> That works too. And just kind of think about it in a bunch of different ways. It all's good. Um, so we've been thinking about this series, Resurrection Story, and this is the last Sunday I want to talk with you about resurrection stories. And, um, and I want to summarize just a few quick points as we get here. The first thing is we've been using the Gospel of John, and the reason why I like the Gospel of John, I used to hate the Gospel of John growing up as a kid because it had all these sort of literal kinds of sayings that just were in, incoherent or incongru incongruent with the way I thought. Um, as a, as a 20, 20th century, 21st century person, that just some of these things were sort of strange. And then I realized over, the, over a period of time of study and reflection and working with other scholars and study that John's gospel, which is written 40 years after the, uh, after the last gospel and written in the early part of the second century even, so almost 70 years or 80 years after uh, Jesus' death, these these stories and these sayings are part of a whole different com community, a different culture. And John himself is more of a mystic, more of a mystic sort of writer. And in those, in that kind of eye, in those eyes, in that kind of thinking, in that kind of vision, these sayings make a whole lot more sense. They offer a lot more reflective possibilities. So I've been enjoying God, uh, John's gospel. Last, uh, the first week we talked about the imminence of God as we think about resurrection stories and we think about our own stories, but resurrection is not a one-time event. When we think of the imminence of God, in the very beginning of that gospel, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and we understand that Jesus as the Word, the Word was with God. What John was saying is that resurrection has been a part of our reality since the beginning of time. That the essence of God and the reality, the ground of our being, all of that has been a part since the beginning. We're speaking metaphorically, however you want to understand the beginning of time scientifically or theologically or whatever. Metaphorically, John was saying the essence of God's being was at the midst, in the midst of that from the very beginning. The idea of resurrection in Christ was in the beginning from the very beginning, the Word. So, so it, to me, again, that just opens up all sorts of possibilities in terms of how we live our lives and how we connect with one another. The second thing that, I wanted to, that we talked about was this idea that everything is holy then. And we, last week, I think we saw Peter Mayer has this wonderful, there was a video with his song, Everything is Holy Now. Uh, used to be a world half there, heaven's second-rate hand-me-downs. Now I walk with a reverend air because everything is holy now. Uh, even turning water into wine, that used to be a big deal. Now everything's a big deal. Now anything, how can you even find some place where there isn't a miracle? That kind of idea, everything is holy. So we talked a little bit about the very ground of our being having this presence and then I talked last week about acceptance. We talked about grace at the ground of being, too. And this idea of Wesley that, that grace is imminent and present in all things. And so we baptized my granddaughter, and, and I talked with you a little bit about grace. But the essence of grace that's the hardest thing for all of us to accept, ultimately, is our own selves, right? I mean, it's our own lives that we have the hardest time sometimes coming to terms with. And uh, we find ourselves in these narratives that are oftentimes uh, counterproductive or destructive or doubtful or, or victim. Uh, you know, we have all these different narratives. I'll get to that towards the end, too. But this idea that at the very core of our being is this acceptance, it should change the way we look at everybody. 
I love how my, grand, my great great aunt Ninny, I used to love how, when riding with her. She never drove. She was born in 1880 something, died in 1979, um, 80. She almost lived to be 100. She was 98, 99. And aunt, aunt Ninny was so wonderful because she rode the bus downtown from, from Colonial Country Club area. She lived in a little tiny frame house. My little brother and I would go over there and hang out and he would babysit us. And there was a little crawdad creek behind her place that we'd go down and, and you know, do some hunting and stuff. And, and, uh, and, and she would go, while we were playing, she would take the bus. She'd walk to the bus on university, so it was a good half a mile to a mile walk. And then she would take the bus downtown to Monning's. Some of you all remember Monning's downtown. And I think it was on the downstairs where there was a candy shop in the center of the store. And she'd walk down there to get two boxes of candy. She did this every other day or so. And then she would take the box of candy, get back on the bus, and she'd ride home and give away at least one box of candy on the way home. She'd just hand it out. Then she saved the second box for her because that was her food. That was her evening meal with some candy, some chocolate, and a glass of milk. She lived to be 99 years old. I mean, I don't get it, but I used to think, wow, I'm going to try this someday. But, but she, seriously, that was, that was her life. She'd make us a, a, you know, a, a ground beef patty or something, and then she would eat the chocolate. But I remember riding with her. She never, would she never learned how to drive a car, never trusted it, scared her to death, so she always rode the bus. No matter who was on the bus, she always rode the bus and handed out chocolates. But um, I remember riding with her sometimes on the highway, and she would say how, she would notice how many people they are, there are on the highway, how many cars, you know, speeding around. And I think of myself and my wife as we're driving around, and we're just navigating traffic and getting angry. I'm like, we want to get home, heading out west before 4.15, because that's when the traffic going out to Alito and Weatherford packs up. It's miserable. And my Aunt Ninny would ride in the traffic and go, look at all these people. They must have really important places to go to. I wonder what they're... I mean, she just had this optimistic sort of attitude, wondering about where all these people were going and how their lives were important. And if they were in a hurry, she would hope that they weren't going to get hurt and that they, did, that they got where they needed to go in a hurry. She just had this attitude about life. So having this everything is holy and this acceptance, this idea that we are all accepted at our core... It truly should change how we see one another in all situations and circumstances. But that is so difficult for us, right? So challenging for us sometimes. So today, I want to talk about this last idea of resurrection. We'll close it all up. And as DeAndrea shared with you at the very beginning, um, she really nailed it because I was going to go there anyway. But it's all about, I think, how we see a thing. The challenge for us to see something. Richard Rohr, the, uh, the Franciscan monk in, in New Mexico, which many of you, whom many of you know and have read some of his stuff, you know, he talks about it being um, second sight, seeing something for the first time again. The way that T.S. Eliot, the, writer, the poet who wrote uh, Four Quartets, Little Giddings, I love how he says this. He says, with the, dawn, with the drawing of this love and the voice of this calling, and I think to myself, I'm not sure he's talking about God here, but I hear it anyway. Or the, or the divine calling or, or the essence of our being calling us to something greater. However you want to see it. But he says, with the drawing of this love and the voice of this calling, we shall not cease from exploration and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and to know the place as if for the first time. Right? To see it as if for the first time. I love that idea. That perhaps that's what resurrection is really all about, is learning to accept this core of our being and to somehow find a way to see through that lens of experiencing life anew. So I think it's about seeing clearly. I was watching a video the other day of a um, Rachel Ray show that happened last year, I think, or the year before. And I forget the guy's name. I want to say it was Michael. It might have been something else. But he was on the show with his wife and his uh, small child, uh, like a one-year-old. And um, he had been, he'd had this vision problem. Somebody in here knows the technical term for it. But where he could only see the smallest amount of, of, visual, of visual field of perception. And so everything with his glasses meant that he had to read things with, from, from like two or three inches out. He, if he was going to look at you, he could only see you from up very close. Everything else was a total blur. A blur. And so this doctor has found this way of, the, of, of creating these glasses that when you put the glasses on, you see the full field of vision clearly. It, it somehow works with your perceptual challenge and actually helps you to see everything. So for the first time, he was going to see his wife and his child incomplete 
right, in total perspective, and to see others and, and even the scenery and everything in a total perspective. And so when he puts on the glasses, he's stunned, right? And, and she's crying because it also is hooked up to a, a projector so that you can see what he's seeing now. And he's literally seeing like I'm seeing here, and I get to see all of you all, or I get to see your face in total, or your whole, your whole feature, right? I get to see everything. He's seeing it for the first time. And, it's, and he's, he's stunned, and Rachel's looking for words to fill, in his, to fill in for him, right? And he just literally cannot speak. He's seeing all of this for the first time. And, and then he begins to cry. And, um, and, and again, she's like, okay, I think she's thinking, okay, well, we got to wrap this segment up, you know. This is going to go a while before we actually hear what this really means to him. And I'm thinking, how can you possibly begin to think what this really means for him to be able to see something for the first time? I think that's resurrection, I think that's what it means sometimes to truly see life, see one another, see our responsibility and connection to life the same way God would see it, the same way life invites us to see it, with this bigger perspective that where it's no longer just about me or just about you, but in fact it's always about others, and that illuminates everything. There's a great little story. Um, how many of you all remember Donovan? Anybody in here remember Donovan? Anybody remember this song? First there is a mountain, then there is no mountain, then there is... Oh my gosh, really? Yeah. Or do you remember that because it was a 2008 Toyota advertisement? <laughs> The RAV4 that they were advertising would drive from a mountain into the city and back to a mountain, then into a city, and all the while it's like, there is a mountain, then there is no mountain, then there is. Of course, that was an old Donovan song that they were taking to use for their, for their advertisement, but, but the story goes way back, right? It, it's an old Zen tale. It's an ancient Zen tale from the Tang Dynasty, like the 8th century A.D., uh, 9th century A.D., and, and it was a story that was circulating around about an emperor who had studied Zen for 30 years. And prior to studying Zen, he'd always seen mountains as mountains and rivers as rivers. But then he said as, as he studied Zen, he couldn't see anything. Everything was a question. And then after studying Zen for 30 years, someone asked him what he understood now and what he had learned from this. And he smiled and said, now I see that a mountain is a mountain. And rivers are rivers. And it, the interesting thing is, unless we've been blind for a while and realize it and suddenly see something else, see it all anew, like Michael Anderson with the glasses or any one of us that have had this kind of challenge in our lives that suddenly has said, I've been missing everything and now I see everything so much more clearly. Unless we've had that, that story doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It sort of sounds like somebody's saying resurrection's possible and we're all hanging around waiting for it to happen. Mountains are mountains. After Zen, mountains are mountains. It seems a little bit foolish, I think, sometimes to think in those terms. I've been had the chance this past week to visit with a lot of you all. I've been I've visited with almost um, I don't know, I think I, I, I think I don't know if you're all doing this in concert, but it seemed like for months nobody would check off, let's have pie with Tom. And then last week I had pie six times with people. And I only walked the same amount that I normally walk, so, so uh, I'm a little concerned about this. But I had coffee with a bunch of folks, and I had pie with a bunch of folks, and then we had our usual sort of gatherings during the week that we have in small groups. And, and the interesting thing about it is, is that I've just had the best time. Um, I forget sometimes how profound a gift it is to hear someone else's story, to simply be the receiver, the receptacle for someone else's story. I forget how lovely that can be. And oftentimes, we're not telling our story, we're telling the story we think you want to hear, or we're telling the story we think we need to be presenting, or we think we're supposed to be. But if you're listening close enough and if you keep sort of being present enough, you begin to hear something else. You begin to allow this sort of trust to take place that oftentimes takes long time, periods of friendship. And, 
and you start hearing these stories that literally can change your life in the listening. So for all of those that I had pie with, um, and for a couple of you who actually bought my lunch, hint, hint, if you're interested, you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, seriously, for those of you who, who did that, it was a gift. It truly was a gift. I told you that in, the, in our meetings, but it really was a gift. I want to share with you one gift that I had, and I, I kind of mentioned I would do this, and I won't say the individuals, but I remember there's, I mean, we, we have, all, all of us, so many of us have issues going on, right? I mean, we're dealing with we're dealing with pains. We're dealing with mis, with with suffering. We're dealing with uh, life not as, as DeAndrea said. Life isn't going the way we planned it to go for for some of us. Um, for some of us, we've been hit upside the head with something un, completely unexpected. I mean, this happens, right? Um, there's another way that that's put on an old bumper sticker, but it happens. And and the reality is that we all experience these things. There's the old saying. Always approach one another with, with a level of kindness. We do not know the obstacles they are facing at this moment, right? It's true. All of us have these things going on. But sometimes when we're allowed to share these stories with one another, something opens up. And I had the greatest gift as, as I was me meeting with someone who's, who's dealing with cancer, and they said that their partner who's, who's had the cancer is just seeing things now just seeing things, wonderful things all the time, just noticing details. And I remember when, 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 when he said to me, he said, um, you know, it's, it's interesting, why should it take a death sentence to get us to start seeing things, right? I mean, it seems like a strange, harsh thing to say, and yet it seems a reality every single time I've ever worked with anybody who had cancer, almost every single time I've worked with anyone, whether it was I was working with kids at, at pediatric oncology camps, which I did for 12 years, and Brad's been doing it now for 10 years, I think, working with these kids. And every single time I come away with this sense of giftedness because I'm suddenly reminded how important our moments are. Not just our moments, but how we live in those moments. Again, they're not for us, they're for us to participate in and bring life to life. And so I, I see this as this gift. I've shared this with you. Some of you have done this, and I invite you again to pick up the app on your phone and, 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 and uh, download We Croak. It's a great little app. Five times a day it says, don't forget, you're going to die. And you're like, why would I want to hear that? And I'm like, because you're supposed to live, right? And we often live with the denial, all of our lives, all of our stories, all of our narratives, all of the masks we wear, all of these pretenses that we live by are so much centered around these anxieties about loss, these anxieties that life isn't going to be the way we want it to be, or these anxieties that life wasn't the way we wanted it to be, or these anxieties that life is a failure and we have, we've screwed up and we live with this shame. All of these narratives center around this idea of loss, of death, of finitude, of nothing else is possible. We're living in the past looking at the future. Death is simply a reminder that we are invited to live in every single moment. Resurrection is something that offers us to pull out of every moment the depth of being that's present and to share that depth of being with one another. And the best way to do that is to be a receptacle as opposed to as a giver. I hate even being up here sometimes and sharing thoughts, to be quite honest, because I leave here going like, I, I totally wasted everybody's time. I should have been just sitting and listening to stories. We should have just been talking to each other and sharing stories. And here I am rambling on for 15 minutes or so. So I'll try not to ramble too much longer. Paul called it foolishness because it's absolutely, it's still foolish to this very day. We live in an, an attention economy where everything is focused on getting your attention. We don't realize it, but when we're looking at our phones, and although I agree, I just told you to get weak croak, so it will remind you that five times a day you're going to die randomly. It will remind you that. Um, I guarantee some of you can ask some of the people who have it. It's, it's interesting. I think you should try it. But anyway, that's a whole other thing. In spite of that, when we're spending our time on Facebook, when we're spending our time on Twitter, when we're spending so much time on the, on the, on the phone, I think we need to remember if we're not paying for things, 
we're the product being bought. Our attention is an economy. And we're not realizing just how important it is that we spend that time in connection with life. But instead, we spend it with, with our devices. And I love my device, no question about it. But I think there's this balance that we need to be present with reality. I think it was Anais Nin, the Cuban French writer and poet, 20th century. She said, we don't see life as it is. We see life as we are. The challenge of resurrection and why Paul called it foolishness is because it's not about seeing life as we are. It's about seeing life as it is so that it changes us. So that we invite change, we invite transformation. We see Christ in one another, not because we're trying to be nice to other people, but because they have something to tell us that we don't know yet. If we're not paying attention, we're missing Christ in one another. Call it the presence of God's grace in one another. Call it the depth of being and acceptance in one another. If we're not paying attention to that, then we're living out of our own mask and our own sense of self and we're missing the possibility of resurrection so I'm going to invite the band to come up they're going to share a song in just a minute and I want to finish with the last story here before they, get to, before they do this song attending to life is really challenging for us because as somebody told me this week trying to think about the issues we deal with our brains are pretty lazy and one of the things I'd have to say about this group is this is not a lazy group you wouldn't be here most people who end up leaving is because they really wanted to see something specific they wanted to hear something specific and this whole thing doesn't really speak to sometimes what people are expecting and that's a challenge that's a challenge for us. We come into every encounter with an expectation, with a filter. We come into every worship service oftentimes with an expectation. It's so hard to be present to what else is possible. I mean, certainly you can disagree with everything I say, but it's hard to be present enough to actually want to think about it, right? It's just challenging. Our brains are designed for simplicity. They're capable of so much more, but they're designed to make it easy. That's how our primitive design was, because of survival needs. So the challenge is to see something else, and that takes practice, paying attention to details, being a student in every moment of our lives. What does she have to teach me today? What does this person who just cut in front of me have to teach me about myself? What does this person with whom I totally disagree with have to teach me today? We don't see anything unless we see them as students, unless we see them as attentive, unless we attend to the moments. So I was on a flight, and this woman, and it was a flight, and I, we were, I was coming back from L.A., and this was about eight years ago. And it was an American airline flight, okay? I probably shouldn't mention the airline because I don't want to color your impressions of an airline. But it was an American Airlines. And it was a 737. And, and so there was like three seats and three seats, I think is what the arrangements. And it was packed. And we hit turbulence. And we hit some of the worst turbulence I have ever... This was turbulence where the things opened up above. I mean, the bumps and whatnot, the, the masks dropped down. There was screaming... There were people to my right that were, I, they were Catholic, they had their beads out. There were folks who had books open and they were prayer books. I mean, this, was, this flight had everybody completely afraid of dying. That, I mean, they, this was going to be a crash flight. There was no stability whatsoever. I'm looking over here at Tom, who's a pilot, and he's going like, yeah, 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 that happens all the time. Yeah, do you, know, do you have a camera to see what's going on in the back when that's happening? <laughs> it's chaos back there. They're, they're, they're <laughs> You're like wide-eyed. <laughs> so, <laughs> it was really, 
This is the fun thing about this flight, because I've flown a lot, and not as much as someone like Tom or other pilots or some of you who travel so much for a living, but I've flown a lot, and I'm used to turbulence, and I've been in some hor horrific turbulent moments, but this was one of those moments where it just went on and on and on, and we were dropping several thousand feet, coming up and then dropping and tilting back and forth, and things were falling, and, and, and the flight attendants were kind of anchoring stuff, and there was a panic, and this woman looked next to me, and she'd already talked to me, and I'd already made the mistake of saying I'm a minister, and she reached over and grabbed my hand with such a grip that I thought she was going to break my fingers, and she said, are you praying for us? <laughs> and two thoughts came to my mind. The first was not at the moment, and the second one was, you wouldn't ask me that if you really knew who I was. I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, maybe my wife would pray better than I do, but I don't know. No, of course I was praying. I mean, in any moment, I don't care what you think about prayer or how it works or agency or how that works, divine aid, it doesn't matter. At that moment, you're thinking, oh, God, I hope we don't crash, you know, and there's just this terror, and I look up ahead of me, and three rows up, this woman motions to the flight attendant, and I'm thinking she's, you know, upset and screaming, and she says, please come here, and, she's, and so the flight attendant comes, and she says, I have something in my purse, but it slid two rows forward, and so she brings the purse, and she brings it back, and then she says, stay seated, and then she runs back and gets in the seat, and I watch this woman pull out a chocolate bar. <laughs> I'm kidding you not. She pulls out a chocolate bar. And everybody else is just, ah! I mean, there's like screaming, there's crying, and she's got a chocolate bar, and she breaks it off, and she turns to the person next to her. I can't see the person, but clearly they said no, because she takes the piece, and then she turns, and she reaches across the aisle, and she can't get anybody to eat the chocolate. But she's eating the chocolate just sitting there waiting. And after about 20 minutes, the flight settles down, and we're all taking a deep breath and sighing relief, and, you know, who knows it? And the woman that's just about broken my hand said, your prayers must have worked. You know, and I just kind of smiled, you know, and just said, I'm just glad we're all okay and everything was going to be fine. You know, we have, you know, I kind of explained turbulence happens. This was just a, a lot of it. This was a scary amount of it. And everything settled down. We landed and there was huge applause, right? When we land, there's huge applause. And um, apparently the pilots don't hear any of it. They could care less. They're just... <laughs> So, um, but no, it was, it was a great, it turned out to be great. After we got in the, the, the gangplank, you know, as we're walking, I guess that's what they call it, as we're the jetway or whatever, jet, not a gangplank, that's something else, yeah. <laughs> that may have been what I was feeling on the plane, yeah. Um, but as we're walking through the jetway, um, I, uh, I, I, I caught up with this woman and I asked her, you know, I said, I couldn't help but, I, you know, we were panicked, but I had to laugh for just a moment because there you are in the midst of all this panic and, she, and you were eating chocolate. And she said, I've just learned that sometimes in the midst of chaos, if I don't have something to focus on that has meaning and depth to it, then I'm completely lost. And she said, I love chocolate. And it reminded me of that Zen story, right? You remember, some of you all remember the Zen story, the man being chased by the lion, sometimes the woman, and they're being chased, and they find themselves hanging off a cliff, and they're hanging by an ivy, and down below them is this tiger. And so wherever she goes, if she tries to get up, if she falls, she's going to be eaten one way or the other. And then she knows the strawberry right there on the vine and eats the strawberry and says, it was delicious. <laughs> a friend told me once that sometimes life is like crashing waves. And then he said, you got to hit it like a surfer. Sometimes we're buried under and we're being planted. Sometimes we can't, we feel like we're that bud that just, the risk to hold tight in the bud, as Anais Nin said, the risk holding tight as a bud is far greater than the risk letting go and blossoming. Or like my friend said, sometimes the wave is crashing and the only way to deal with it is to look with it at curi with curiosity and go, I wonder if I can surf this one. I wonder if I can hit this one. We've all surfed waves. We've all made it. We've all survived a lot of stuff. I wonder if I can hit this one now. That's resurrection. Resurrection is that invitation at the depth of life that says, in spite of what's happening, there is something at the depth that calls us to find the life that's present. And sometimes the best we can do is find that in one another. And sometimes the best we can do is to find that in life itself blade of grass, a flower, a butterfly. Maybe that's why people say when they suddenly realize they've been given this warning, everything starts to look beautiful. Amen.